Infinity. So let's start. Uh, the aim of my presentation is actually not to answer what is bio art, but make more questions of what is really bio art. And I mentioned, I named this presentation bio art from inspiration to integration, uh, because we will analyze some artworks that were made inspired by biotechnology or made by biotechnological technologies and uh, tools. So as I told, my name is Laura Rodriguez. I, I think I still cannot call myself, myself bioartist, but I'm trying to do something like that. I'm a biotechnologist and I'm very interested in the popularization of science art. So before answering or question ourselves more, what is bioart? It's necessary to state the conditions that, or the historical uh, fr framework that bioart forms. So in one hand, we have the relationship between art and science that is super old. So we can imagine Da Vinci, he was making some amalgam between art and science, but then we have like the over specialization when we start to make categorize and categorize life, like the part of nature that is geology, biology, and then more categories like genetics, molecular biology, but these were made for us, for humans to understand more about what is around us. And so my purpose to talk about bioart is to talk about one of the most modern formulation for one of the oldest relationships that is art and nature. So artists always have found inspiration in nature. And why are we talking now about bioart? Well, because of the biotechnological revolution of the last century, and art has been always a fragile entity. What I mean is that art always reflects the social changes, political, philosophical changes, and not only reflect, but also participated in the process of precipitating and promoting the changes. So last century, we start to understand the living system mutate. Then we start to mutate other living systems and technology allow us to make sequencing faster, understand all these phenomena with DNA faster. So in other terms, uh, art always react to the current situation of the world. And Hegel say, for example, that art is a manifestation sensitive to an idea. So in this case, bioart is uh, the sensitivity that corresponds to the reality of a techno world that we live. Nowadays, it's not so easy to distinguish what is already artificial or what is nature. We live in this techno world where everything is connected through technology. And bioart forms in, in this. And one key point for biotechnology and bioart is one of the biggest drawberies of the science. And I call this drawberry the DNA discovery because everyone knows that Watson and Crick discovered the DNA. Uh, but it was actually for the work of Rosalind Franklin. Rosalind Franklin was a scientist, female scientist working in the 50s, 60s. And she was actually kind of advocate of the science, uh, the opening of science for women. But for example, she couldn't enter to the coffee room in the Institute of Science to bring coffee with other male scientists. So she faced a lot of problems making her research. And he had, she, has, she had this um, collaborator, Wilkins, and Wilkins often shared her work with Watson and Crick without her permission. So actually Watson and Crick uh, understood uh, the DNA structure because they only have theories, but the proof was given by the research of Franklin. But of course, she was not as an author in the paper. She didn't receive the novel. Uh, that's why I call it robbery. But this discovery of the DNA sequence started to inspire a lot of artists, and Dali started to paint uh, DNA molecules in their in his paintings. And, and this is a key point for biotechnology and for, bi for bioart. So it will be very bold and kind of senseless if I just give you one definition of bioart. Uh, actually, the term bioart. Uh, engaged in a battle in, in the 90s when the boom of using biotechnology in art start and everyone was putting different names bioart living art 
but if you put the, the title bioart in your installation and it goes to history, well, you will be recognized as the father of bioart. So it was important for artists that their term uh, remain in the history of art. I nevertheless like to share this definition is made by George Church. Uh, he is a geneticist working in Harvard. And he collaborates with a bio artist, Joe Davis. He is one of the pioneers artists working with biotechnology. There is actually a movie called um, Earth and Heaven and Joe Davis. And it is very interesting to watch. I totally recommend it. And he was working in the laboratories in the 80s, 90s, but he actually came uninvited. So he was going to the MIT, for example, in USA not asking, but almost demanding that allow him to work in the lab because he has some ideas and he can only make it in the lab. So they allow him in the end. And last year they made like this concept of bio art that says something like they that bio art is a contemporary art form that adapts scientific methods and biotechnology to explore living system as artistic subjects. And all these initiatives try to blur or erase the boundaries between art and biotechnology. And the topics that they make emphasis is mostly about philosophical issues, societal or environmental issues. Uh, as I told you, there, is, there was a war how to name this new art using biotechnology or living organisms. So there is transgenic art, live art. The most recently that I heard in the Chinese history of art is an bio art. There is still um, a kind of war to, to name this art, but the most popular is now bio art. Uh, and another debate is how to define what is bio art and what is not. So in the book Bio Art and the Vitality of Media, uh, Robert Mitchell separate two types of bio art, the prophylactic and the vitalis. The prophylactic is uh, traditional media like painting or sculpture that addresses biotechnology issues. And the vitalis are the works that are created through biotechnology using, uh, using organisms or transgenic modifications. This is just one of the several branches, categories that you will find and refer to because it's still a new topic for curators and historians of art, how, how this will pass to the history of art. And there is also, of course, the opposition. And there is a quote for Hans Hauser, this is another curator of media working in Ars Electronica. Um, he said, there is no bio art, or there is only bio art. So bio uh, alludes to life or in a more philosophical way to men. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think we have a microphone. We are sorry about this little interruption and uh, I, I, I want to use this interruption to remind you, Laura, to show us some uh, visual material if, if you have uh, some sure. images, yes, because we want to see something <laughs> also. Sure, I'm going there. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. so um, if man is kind of alive and, or it is alive and is part of bio, then everything can be bio art. But I'd like to, to mention uh, one category that, or one tendency that Daniel Lopez de Rincon does about bio art, that it can be biothematic, biomedia, or bioactivist. So let's start with biothematic. It only takes a topic from biotechnology and use the traditional art uh, tools like painting. So this will be similar, like Mitchell say that is prophylactic. We have here uh, the painting from Alexis Strockman. You can see a world of biotechnological modified 
animals. We have a square cow and we have a pig here and make allusion to the use of pigs to, to cul culture organs for humans. So his topic is about the effects of biotechnology in relation with uh, animals and agricultural. And this is 2000s, but then in biotematic, we can go earlier and to 1963, we have here Dali. If, you, if we consider that bioart starts, sorry, starts with the topic of biotechnology, then Dali enters in bioart in this case, because he's actually drawing DNA uh, structures in his paintings. And this one is Gala, Galacidala Acidex Oxidibolonucleic Acid name. There is very funny because in the 63, all the contemporary artists were naming the, the artworks just like artwork number one, blue, red, uh, yellow, artwork number 72. Laura, I'm very sorry to interrupt you one more time and remind you to, sh to translate your screen because we don't see any presentation. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, yes, so I was just talking. <laughs> Yes, I, I was writing to you in chat, but maybe you didn't see my messages. Okay, can... sorry for that. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh -huh. So, okay, we can start <laughs> now seeing some materials, right? Yes, uh, we're waiting for it. Do you see it now? Uh, it's uh, it's loading, but um, maybe in in just a, a couple of seconds we will see it full screen. Yes, we are almost there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, these are the the technological issues of the pandemia. New oh, yes. <laughs> Okay, what about now? Do you see my full full screen? Yes, your full screen. Now it's everything is perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. So, well, here I show uh, some of the historical moments of bioart, and then I share about the discovery of DNA. Uh, what is bioart for the scientists? Uh, George Church and Joe Davis, a pioneer bioartist, different names of bioart. And then one category for Robert Mitchell, prophylactic and vitalist art. And then we have these three clouds that Daniel Lopez del Rincon make, biothematic, biomedia, and bioactivism. So here we have biothematic. That I was telling you, it used different um, traditional techniques of art, like painting or sculpture. And this is the one about the biotechnological modified animals, the square cow and the pig. And this one is from Dali, actually. So if, if the theories of art and art historians are considering biotematic as bio art, they must consider, for example, Dali artworks. Another one that is the one that I'm more interested and passionate about is biomedia. When we use the plants or animals and microorganisms and everything that is considered in the spectrum of life to present a conceptual idea or an artwork. And in this case, biomedia starts in 1936 officially when Edward Station presents delphiniums, this plant that it was selected, artificially selected for present some characteristics like more flowers, longer uh, plants. And he presented in the MoMA. So for those in art, MoMA is one of the biggest institutions. So if you present your artwork there, that's like the top of your career. But we're talking in 1936, MoMA only have a few years open. It was not relevant this exhibition. Moreover, Edward was working there in the um, Department of Photography. So they have a space and he presents his delphiniums. Now it's important for art, art history. Uh, but 
in this case with biomedia, we can also refer to Fleming that you remember from your class of biology in high school, Fleming discovered the penicillium. How he did that, he had a lot of bacteria and some fungus growing in his table and so the, the bacteria didn't grow near the fungi. And then they found the molecule penicillin that we use as antibiotic. But he was making paintings. So this mother and his baby and this baby is made with colonies of bacteria. So this might also enter to biomedia. In contemporary art, my, we might ask Fleming for storytelling behind or so, some concept behind his artworks, but that's a different story. This is where people start to use biomaterials to make art. Another more um, current uh, artwork is semi-living worry dolls. So you see a humanoid figure here. I, you even see like the face. I like to think that is smiling and not screaming for, for, for help. But this doll, uh, it was inspired for the Guatemalan dolls. The tradition of these dolls is that you take the doll and share some of your concerns or griefs uh, to the doll in the night, then put it under your pillow, you sleep, and the next day, this doll will solve your problem or your concern. So the artist Oron Katz took this concept and create the semi-living worry dolls. What you see here is cells uh, from skin, muscle, and bones that grow around this degradable uh, polymer. And they were growing here in this flask. So this is the original worry doll from Guatemala. And this is the Australian one. And something funny is that I found in Russia uh, the equivalent of this doll. So this one is it's not for worries, it's for traveling. So you take this doll and it's supposed to help you to travel more. I bought it two months ago, but I think that it was not pandemic guaranteed. So I, I, I haven't left Russia since then, but it's interesting to, to see the Russian um, analog, the Guatemalan, and then the transgenic Australian worry doll that Oren did. And then the bioactivism tendency uh, this one is better to explain with the example. So the critical art ensemble make the flesh machine where the participants were attending the gallery and they were analyzing the DNA of the people entering and make a simulation of bio classes division according to economy based in biotechnology. So they were analyzing how fertile you were. And if you were more fertile, well, you, you have bigger value for the bio, uh, bio system uh, in, in their artwork. So th this also talks about our value as a human or as a species for the current system. Another work that I like a lot is by Heather Dewey, Stranger Visions. And when you see it, you enter to the gallery and see this face 3D printed and it looks kind of um, kind or nice to watch. But the interesting part is that she took from the street different pieces of garbage, for example, the cigarette. And then she extracts from the saliva here, the DNA, then sequence it to, to understand what genes are in this DNA and then make a phenotypic analysis. That means to see what is the combination of your genes and translate it in how you prob probably look. So it's a prob probabilistic analysis. So the person that smoked the cigarette probably looks like this man. So that's why it's a stranger visions because she never met this person, but she's making portraits from it. Uh, she mentioned that the inspiration came from a therapy appointment. So she was with a psychologist and find, found a, a hair in the sofa and start to wonder to whom it belongs. And then he, she used uh, biotechnology to make these stranger visions. Uh, this 
talks about genetic surveillance and the path of our genetic information that we are living uh, around the city. So if you are smoking cigarettes outside Heather Dewey house, well, don't be surprised if someday you enter to the gallery and see someone, the, the face of someone that looks similar to you. And well, th those were the three main tendencies, biothematic, biomedia, and bioactivism. I like to go to make emphasis in biomedia because for me is one of the strongest tendencies in bioart. Why? Well, because the uh, Marshall McLuhan said the medium is the measure. So it's important what materials are you using to express your artistic concept. And in the other hand, we have philosophers like Donna Haraway. And Donna Haraway says that it matters what matters we use to think other matters. Again, making emphasis in what materiality are we using. It matters what stories we tell to tell other stories, the notes, uh, not notes, and the thoughts think thoughts. So what she's saying is how we need to change our perspective. If you are talking about how an insect perceives the world, you cannot think as a human how the insect perceives it because then you are making a longer pathway. So it's important what material, what technology, what concepts are you using? And biomedia is very focused in, in this materiality. So another part is, uh, well, one of the pioneers that I mentioned is Joe Davis. And Joe Davis in 1980 was working already in the MIT and Harvard. And he made the first synthetic molecule of DNA for artistic purposes called microvenus. And it represents the symbol of the female genitalia. And it also represents the Germanic rune of female earth. So he translated this symbol into um, ones and zeros uh, in the computer, the um, uh, language of computers, and then translate this into DNA, adenine, cytosine, one in antimine, and then send it to the space. But why he did that? Well, he did it as a response for a scientific project that was made of, with the NASA and Carl Sagan. The, this is called the Pioneer Table. It was sent in the Pioneer aircraft that NASA sent. And the idea was that if this space aircraft find some alternative life, they could understand where this artifact came from. So there, there is um, a scale of the artifact and the scale of the human height. There is the male and the female. And here we have the solar system, here is the earth. So we are kind of telling uh, if they find some uh, life in the space, Mr. Alien, we came from here. And there is also a lot of reference of chemical compounds, compounds like the hydro, hydrogen bond. And you can see that the male genitalia is quite well represented, but the female genitalia is not existent. So years later, Joe Davis sent this as a response for the uh, scientific project of the NASA. Like, okay, we forgot this part, but not, this is the second part of the message. He also sent contractions, uh, video contractions of the vagina to the space. And he has been doing this since uh, 1980. So you can understand that bioart, although now it's in hype, is quite old already. Another of the pioneers that we must know is Eduardo Katz. And Eduardo Katz made the artwork Genesis. This is how the installation looks like. Uh, here there is a petri dish. A petri dish is a small box of crystal or plastic where we culture bacteria or fungi. And they have here E. coli. That is one of the bacteria that we use a lot in research. And what they did, well, these artworks talk about the intricate relationships between biology, belief systems, information of the technology and ethics. So they, took a piece of text from the biblical book Genesis, therefore the name, translated into Morse, course, uh, Morse code, 
and after that into DNA code. So you see each artist developed their own technique to make symbols into DNA or to make text into DNA. And then they put this sequence or synthetic gene into a plasmid that insert in a bacteria. It means that this sequence was inside a bacteria. The bacteria grow up happy in an environment with a lot of food and reproduce. And after each reproduction, there is a risk of mutation. Mutation is something inherent to life. Uh, so after uh, several generations, they took back the DNA, translated into mode co uh, code morse, and then into the letters that uh, in an English alphabet. And then we see some mutation, for example, uh, man is translated into on, and then instead of moves, it says yovs. So for Eduardo Katz, he baptized this gene as an artistic gene. So the, ar the artist stopped to be the human and becomes a piece of code, a DNA. And therefore, we start to give some subjectivity to objects that before didn't have any influence in, in art or in science. The object becomes an artifact when it's now in the museum, but when you give subjectivity or power of change to this, it becomes a biofact. And biofact is the name of the, a lot of installations in, in bioart. So those were two examples of pioneers in the 90s of bioart. And now I want to mention uh, one of the current artworks. This is from last year uh, in the Festival of Ars Electronica. Ars Electronica is the festival for excellence for art and science. So if your artwork is there, it's also like a big um, hype for your career. And if you win the Golden Nika, that is the award of the festival, is for sure that your artwork is recognized in the scientific artistic community. And Paul Banus won the gold Nika last year and he established a very simple question, how does exploitation smell? So in your skin right now, there is a lot of bacteria. Some of them are beneficial to your skin, some of them maybe not, but in all the surface, there is a lot of bacteria and fungi and our skin is not the exception. So he was analyzing the bacteria that lives in our skin and how we contribute to our smell. So each person is not different. And a lot of these differences because of the bacteria that lives. So in his installation, he put these three uh, bioreactors. It means that bacteria is growing here. They have three bacteria, Staphylococcus epidermis, Corinibacterium serosis, and Propionibacterium avidum that contributes to the smell. And the t-shirt here in the middle uh, represents uh, the clothes that a lot of people working in condition of anxiety and slavery in mines and minery industry were using. Uh, so the bioreactors are connected to different tubes to this t-shirt that is uh, protected by the glass, impregnating it with the smell. So is the smell of slavery, the smell of exploitation. And something that I like to remark here is the power of, of the curatorial design because the media where bacteria uh, lives, it really looks like dirty water. It looks like um, a brown, very concentrated tea. It is not so spectacular when you see a medium with bacteria, but here they put some lights under the bioreactor that gives this techno scientific elegance and is very important for the bio art in the question of aesthetics. Um, here there is a small video, but uh, we might have some problems with the connection to, to make it uh, work. I'm not sure if you can see it normally. But the point that I wanted to, to share is that here is some small holes. So the person could approach near to the center of the installation and perceive the smell because uh, all the, the air and um, the 
production of smell was traveling to the tubes and being here. So it was different if you visit the exhibition the first day that if you visit it in the seventh day, it will smell more. And another artwork in Ars Electronica last year that I, I fall in love with it is from Marta de Meneses. It's called Anti Marta. Uh, she's dealing now with a lot of topics of ident identity and self perception. So you see here the arm of Marta and two circles, uh, two scars. This project is about skin transplantation. She got inspired by the scientists working in a skin transplant in America last century. So what they were doing, they were taking part of their skin and put it in another part also where they remove skin and see how it make a scar, if integrates again to their skin or if it is rejected. And in the 70s, if you were a scientist in America, Everyone will know that you're working with the skin transplant because you have these two scars. So she made this with her partner of life, her husband, uh, Luis Garza. Luis Garza is a scientist and Marta is an artist. So for me, they also represent the humanization of art and science because they, they decide to collaborate together. They have been together more than 20 years. So Marta was addressing here also uh, how when you are in a relationship you kind of become a symbiotic organism and and for her working also with science it was a little pro uh, problematic to, to distinguish what her, she was doing what Louise was doing what was the middle point so she decided to make this performance with him and there is also an installation where a projector make the sur surgery in your arm just with a projection and so what she did, she made this to extraction of skin. The part of her skin came to this, but the part, uh, the section of this uh, part of her skin came into the arm of Louise and a part of Louise's skin came to this hole. So what happened is that the body of Martha recognized her own tissue and just uh, make a scar around it and integrate her own skin. However, the skin of Louise was rejected. So basically, why is rejected? Well, because your body has a system, immunological system, that detects the tissue that is not uh, yours or the DNA or RNA that is not yours. That's why we react to viruses or to bacteria because they are ex uh, external factors. So the piece of uh, skin of Louise went dry and then just fall and the same skin of Martha cover this hole. So for me, this is very romantic. It, it talks about sharing one of the most sensitive parts of your body, intimate the skin, your skin with someone else. But of course, also uh, confirm the possibility of being together in a relationship but not overcoming the biological limits. So that, that gives you a sense of identity that Marta was looking through this artwork. And this is one of the contemporary artworks of bioart. Uh, the last uh, artwork that I want to mention here is uh, again, Eduardo Katz. This was very polemic. Uh, the rabbit here is called Alba. And Alba is a modified rabbit with a green fluorescent protein. And the protein or the gene was they took from the Aukiora Victoria jellyfish inserted in the embryo of a bunny. And this protein fluorescence when it's under ultraviolet light. So they made some pictures of the bunny. So actually what we only have about this artwork are pictures and in the scientific community has been very criticized because you can see that everything glows, even her eye and her hair. And that doesn't correspond uh, with the data that we have of how external proteins distribute in the body of organisms. So a lot of people have challenged the veracity of this artwork. Me personally, I don't care if it was real or not. Or not. He already put out Im an image in our mind. And that is already 
making some debate. So for me, already enters in the contemporary art projects that uh, make questions about my, uh, modify organisms. And it also talks about our responsibility with them. So humans always had the desire of the compulsion to imagine different creatures. Like I can quote the, the Greek mythology and the Minotaurus. And now technology is giving us the chance to make these creatures or chimeras uh, to reality. But one surprising thing was the reaction of the people. So when people saw Alva, they thought about her like a monster. It's a glowing monster. Uh, it's not natural. It shouldn't exist. And I think they made a very good decision to make a bunny because a bunny is something cute and nice and gives you chocolate and Easter tradition. Uh, because in the lab, we have rats and mice and frogs. So it will be a little bit more scary. if We have a rat that glows red, for example. But nevertheless, it's a rabbit and people still thought that it was like a monster. And of course, that uh, brings up a lot of debates. And Eduardo makes a nice experiment that now I, I want to make with you. Uh, this is basically the tutorial. So you take your sleeve or your clothes and try to put your hand very close to your skin without touching it. So like one millimeter. If you are doing this, you will start to knock a little bit of heat and it's normal or skin emanates heat. So when you are in winter in Russia or in Belarus uh, and it's very cold, well, you want that someone cuddles you and steal the, the warmness of their skin through thermodynamics. But this heat is actually infrared and the human eye doesn't have the ability to see infrared. But other organisms have this ability, like uh, reptiles or some insects, and they see the infrared from humans. And for them, we basically look like this. So we are also glowing monsters for them. So what I, what I think is that they are seeing this glowing blob by pedal around the world, making a lot of stuff, changing the, the, the world. And let's, it's important, or what I wanted to mention this, uh, here we need to rethink what Donna Haraway says, that it matters what matters we use other matters and the thoughts we use to think about other thoughts. So in bio art, the aesthetic is very challenged because we are not so used to understand, for example, glowing animals. But if you analyze it from a scientific point of view, then human is also a uh, glowing animal. And then you can take this to bio art or you can take this when you are very depressed and sad in the morning, just look at this, uh, the mirror and understand that you are glowing every day. So in this part of the aesthetics, I want to go a little bit deeper. Uh, there is a philosopher of uh, aesthetic in bio art, a Mexican curator, Maria Antonia Gonzalez Valerio. And she is making analysis of different artworks. For example, this is Polona Tratnik. And here, Polona was talking about the fetishizing, fetishizing of hair. Uh, there is something that is expression of ourselves, of our intimacy. And she presenting these images when we are seeing blood and different transplants of hair. And sometimes it can make us give us gums, gas comes. So you feel like, oh, this is not so beautiful to watch. Um, so uh, Maria says that uh, it's necessary to think maybe in different aesthetics for bio art, considering the mobility, flexibility, hybridization that bio art takes. Um, Polona make a term, uh, transarte, in order to describe the art that exceeds the, exceeds the modern determinations of art. And uh, I have an anecdote. When I was sharing in a previous lecture, a lot of artworks working with bacteria and fungi, that is very uh, common also in bio art. In the end of the lecture, uh, uh, a man came to me and said like, thank you for the lecture. It was very nice and disgusting. And I really understand his point of view because we are used to see fungi and bacteria as a process of rottening. So if you leave uh, orange, 
in your fridge or outside for a long time, then some fungi start to grow and smells not good. And, and we have like this repulsion for bacteria. But in this artwork, Melissa Fisher, she is addressing her identity uh, with all the bacteria that lives in her skin. So I already told you and we established that bacteria lives in your skin. So what she did is sculptures of her own face and then took a swab, collect the bacteria from her skin and put it in these sculptures and see how the bacteria grows. So this bacteria is part of here. And now we have a scientific uh, research that uh, established that the bacteria that lives in your gut or in your skin might affect your psychological state. So there is the brain, uh, brain axis gut, no, sorry, brain gut axis, uh, that is explaining how the biochemistry of, or the reaction of the bacteria that lives inside you is also affecting your, your mood, for example. Um, so sometimes bio art makes some, em, evokes some emotion of disgust. Um, I think all art should evoke some emotion. Sometimes it's inspiration, serenity, beautiful, I don't know, whatever thing you feel when you see some artwork. And uh, Maria Antonia proposed that maybe we need to rethink if, if this gas, for example, is part of the emotions that art could uh, provoke in the observer. Or if it's not, then we need to rethink if bio art is inside of art or not. For me personally, I, I love to experience all the emotions that a human capability can have. So even if there is this gas, it, it makes you think and you came home uh, uh, seeing all these bacteria and now you don't see yourself the same uh, at the mirror. Uh, so now that I mentioned this, I also wanted to share the challenge for the museums. So we have here an image you can see maybe like a small dress, a small coat is, is supposed to be a jacket. And this jacket is made of pixels. Uh, is the artwork is from Oron Cats and it's called Victim's Leather. And this um, artwork intend to confront the people with the moral implications of wearing parts of that animals for uh, protective or aesthetic reasons. And it also confronts our notions of the relationship with uh, manipulating other systems like pigs and cows and how we use it for our meat or for, or for the leather. So they actually took cells from a pig, the pig didn't have any damage and they culture it and, and make a uh, kind of cloth here. Uh, but then this artwork was exposed in MoMA, in, so it, it, it is part of the trend of bio art in a big institution in MoMA, and something very funny happened there. So they have the bioreactor connected with all the nutrients so to keep it alive, all the tissue cells, and it started to grow. And then after five days of exhibition, this thing was growing and growing, and they didn't have on any other option than to close the exhibition. So this, this was really interesting from the point of view of monstrosity, or the point of view of Frank, Frankenstein uh, um, practices. And well, it also tells about life because when you disconnect the installation, what will happen with these cells? They will die. And there was a lot of debate if they were allowed to kill this thing because it cell is considered still as part of life. And then there is like this uh, debate about abortion and the uh, number of cells that are considered life. And they solve this in a very fancy way. They make another performance and how they kill this uh, installation. Uh, however, about the challenge is very expensive. It's not so easy to bring the equipment from the lab to the laboratory because, well, they are using it in the lab and then it, sometimes it costs $300,000. And I cannot borrow to you as a scientific institution for a gallery seven days because I'm actually making research with it. Uh, so it's quite expensive. It's one of the challenge for bio art. Uh, then we have another image here. Uh, there is a lot of small circles. They are Petri dishes. 
uh, in the Museum of Micropia in Amsterdam. They have a permanent exhibition of bacteria and fungi uh, during the whole year. And well, it is also expensive because they have a special section, a laboratory, and a lot of people working there. Every day you see these uh, people in lab coats checking that everything is okay. They need to take some Petri dish, make a new one. And so a lot of artists working with biomatter have opt for traditional representation. So they go to the lab and they work there with the tissue, but then they just take pictures. And in the gallery, they uh, expose only some pictures or videos that is easier to, to bring into the gallery. And because there is also the safety problems or safety con consideration that is possible. It's possible to show bacteria without uh, putting in, in risk the audience. But of course, it requires a little more of protection, more materials, more money. And another challenge is how to sell your artwork. Because for artists, well, we cannot forget that still art is a business. And although we like to romanticize art, well, artists need money to make their artworks. And sometimes it's not so easy to sell because imagine the collectionists have a, a Monet and Dali, and next to it, they need to have a fridge with liquid nitrogen and minus 40 uh, centigrade to preserve some bacteria of the artwork. So it is also a challenge for artists how, how to monetize their, their projects. That's why there is a lot of um, projects collaborating with the institutes of science. And in that case, there is another way to monetize your project all about workshops. So a lot of artists are making workshops when based in their artworks. This flask you see here like a string. This is golden silk. It's also made for Joe Davis. And he bring to life the fairy tale of Rokelsinski making a silk uh, of gold, a string of gold. And it talks about the alchemist dream to convert anything in gold. So they actually put some gene from a marine sponge, Thedia aurantia, into the silkworms. And this uh, protein from the sponge is able to take different ions of metal from the solution. So you put your transgenic silk in a solution with gold. It takes all the gold and you dry it and then you have a string made of gold and in during his workshop well people can understand a little bit more about synthetic biology about molecular biology and this is a way that a lot of artists are monetizing their their artworks uh, just to finalize so i have been mentioned some persons like donna haraway uh, that are philosophers that bio artists are taking us a fundament for the artwork. So bio art is an artistic practice, although it's inside art and science, art and science is contemporary art. It's not a scientific research. Uh, we use biotechnology mostly as a tool, or that's the idea uh, to use it as a tool. It questions our relationship with others, with other species and our kind, and sometimes attempts to redefine the status of life, the nature and artificiality, and reveal, reveal different biopolitical strategies in the current world. Uh, so Timothy Morton, another philosopher in his book, uh, Dark Ecology, he mentions that nature is, uh, the, the worst thing that could happen to nature is the term of nature, because it's a human, imaginary term that we design in order to classify and categorize. But nature now is being disintegrated because now all the plants are somehow selective, uh, modified, that also the selective process is natural. So in, in biology and evolutionary biology, the selectiveness of better genes is natural. So then we need to ask ourselves, uh, what is nature, what is art? Sorry, what is nature, what is artificial? And so 
but the breaking of this idea of nature through bioart ha has created the technophobia. That's why people thought about the rabbit as a monster. And it not only applies to biotechnology, for example, the robots. Uh, when you see a robot that is like totally meta metallic and is talking, but it doesn't have human functions, you just uh, simulate it as a robot. But when you see a robot that is looks really like human, it creates a lot of disturbance in the human psyche. So more human looks the robot, we, sp we, we in some moment expect that it will be less difficult to assimilate the robot, but actually is the opposite. We'll, we tend to do not like or to have this disgust that we were talking uh, through, through the object. Uh, so Timothy Morton mentions that in bioart, um, the term of nature is being disintegrated. Uh, also Donna Haraway mentions that nature and life is something that we need to reinvent. And another part of bioart, very important in philosophical point of view is uh, the text from Bridioti. And she is mostly uh, presenting her ideas of a post-human world and a post-human relationship. So I'm not gonna go so deep here, but if you are interested, that's why I wanted to put these three, three philosophers, Timothy Morton, Rossi Bridioti, and Donna Haraway, that you can read and understand better why artists are doing what they are doing through these new ideas of relationship and new natures and new artificialities. Uh, and to finalize, I just wanted to share why I am personally interested in bioart, because for me, bioart can be analyzed for a very empathic perspective, empathetic perspective, uh, because we are rethinking our connections with other species and other configurations. In the end, everything is made of the same carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and even the virus, even coronavirus is made of the same things that humans are made, just in different conformations. So it really talks about them empathy to other species and the speculation of it i love it because it makes us rethink uh, different possi possible scenarios uh, and of course the scientific popularization that can be done through art in order that the people can honor can can get the ownership of the biopower that is so important nowadays and so as i told you in the beginning i, I was not attempting to make any um, to give you any answer of what is bio art, but actually to make some questions. So you, you get more question of what is really bio art, what is science art. And I will be really happy to, to hear you, your questions. You can write, I think now still have a little bit of time in our chat or write to me, this is my contact. And finally, I want again to, oh, this is the reference that I can share with you too. And finally, I want to say thank you again to Facultative and the Center of Art and Science to give me this time to share with you why I'm interested in bioart. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, it was a very interesting and challenging lecture. Uh, so yeah, it's time, it's time now to ask some questions. Um, Dear friends, you are free to uh, write it in chat or you can uh, ask it <laughs> with your voice. Um, while you're thinking about your questions, uh, I have already one question to uh, Laura. Um, maybe you can name some uh, places, locations, uh, apart from the Arts Electronica Festival. Where can we see uh, bio art? Maybe in it is present in some museums or galleries, maybe even in Russia or in Europe or somewhere else. Yes, I think it's very common to find in any contemporary art museum now. There are some specialized museums like the Museum of Tomorrow in Brazil, especially for science art, the Marina Vase in Sydney, and arts institutions, they are already in the world like Symbiotica in Australia. Uh, we have here in St. Petersburg, the Art and Science Center in the master's degree. Uh, in Moscow, uh, there is Laboratoria that it is a space for exhibition, but also for practice. So as, as I told you, artists are making a lot of workshops and that, that's a common trend now. Okay, thank you. 
and uh, do um, do artists who work in the field of bio art uh, need to co cooperate, collaborate with the biologists to make art? That's a very good question. Um, Daria Parkmonenko, Park Park uh, she has different strategies of collaboration. So some of them really engage artists and scientists working in the lab. Some others bring the scientists to the studios. So you actually do not have the contact with the technology, but you get the advice for the scientists. And I think the, the other trend, it will be this biothematic, when you only take inspiration for, from biotechnological process to make your artwork without the, the material itself. Okay, thank you very much. There are some messages in chat. Uh, uh, yes, and even a question from Maria. Mm -hmm. So I see, please tell us uh, what other bio art monetization can be for artists besides lectures and workshops? Oh, Jesus, I think I'm still <laughs> getting uh, myself this knowledge. Um, yeah, I think residencies is another way and a lot of art, because bio art is in trendy now. So a lot of art institutions open residencies and scientific institutions open residence for art. And also uh, companies, for example, I participated with BioCat, is a biotechnology company very important in Russia. And they had a product for detection of breast cancer. So they usually companies think like, okay, we have this product, but we need to make it more popular. Let's invite an artist. And then the artists uh, try to make something. There is a lot of problematic for that, especially for the artists, because, well, as an artist, you try always to give your own measures, not to marketing a product. And, and sometimes that collaboration is difficult, but there's another way to get money from, from your work. Okay, thank you for the answer. Um, there are also messages uh, with uh, thank you. Uh, and I can answer the question of uh, Gala um, that missed uh, the beginning. Yes, we're going to um, put the translation, the recording of this translation on our channel on uh, YouTube. Um, and we will uh, transmit the, the link to Art and Science Center of Whitmore and to post it on our social media. Uh, there's another question for you, Laura. What should be the path to get into bio art for someone who is not in biotech? Is it possible? Yes, totally, it is possible. Um, most of the people working with bio art are artists, uh, but also from all the um, uh, careers, all the backgrounds, if you are interested in, in art, you can shift. So for example, in the, my master degree, uh, there is uh, fine art artists, there is digital artists, there are engineers, so pet, um, oil and energy, optics. Uh, there is also people interested in just in curatorial studies. So I, I think it, it is not um, about who you were, but who you want to be. And I'm a biotechnologist and in this question is kind of assumed that a biotechnologist can move to art, to art, but it was really difficult for me uh, because I didn't know anything about art. And, and then anyway, I took the step and it doesn't matter, you always can learn anything. So I, I learn about philosophy, I learn about art. So everyone can learn uh, what, whatever is their passion about. So there is no restriction for, for bio art or for anything. That's very inspiring. <laughs> um, so the, the lecture has come to an end. Um, uh, I want to thank you, Laura, one more time. Uh, it's, it was really interesting. Uh, I would also like to thank the Art and Science uh, Center of uh, ITMO. Uh, and uh, yes, there I see one more question. Uh -huh. uh, Yes, uh, Laura, go ahead and answer it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, 
So I, I see there is a lot of questions. I, I also invite you to message to, to us personally uh, or in the Art and Science Center. And we have also more lectures and we have a summer school in, in July. We will talk about bio art and bio design. So you can check the, the website or the Instagram of Art Ithmo. And there you can find more information and stay in contact. Uh, but the next question say, Laura, in your opinion, is there any place to talk about posthumanism in the work of Rabbit by Eduardo Katz? Uh, if this way, a certain hierarchy of a person over, the, or over other creatures is affirmed, and does the point of view change to a certain anthropocentrism? Yes. Okay, this is a really good question. Um, yeah, I'll, there is a lot of artwork that try to challenge the anthropocentrism, anthropocentrism. Uh, but for me, a lot of these artworks is still are based in anthropocentrism because we modify as human, we modify the rabbit and nobody asks the rabbit, do you want to glow? So it, it, it is also, yes, this is a hierarchy of, of the who is making the biopower. That's why the artwork of uh, cats, I think is, not uh, about anthropocentrism, but it's more about responsibility with uh, modify organisms and ethics of what we can do and we can what we cannot do. So um, I, I think there is this this is a important topic. I, I can recall now an artwork of Majes Mekar. She modified her body in order to lactate. She was never pregnant, but she modified her hormonal cycle to lactate and give this uh, lactation to, to a puppy. Uh, so her artwork basically basically tends to talk about empathy to, uh, towards other species and maternity and other topics, but still uh, she's using the, the, the other species, in this case, the, the dog for the performance and where is the subjectivity of the, of the other animals. Um, so yeah, subjectivity of animals, plants is an important topic, not only in bio art, but also subjectivity of artificial intelligence. It, it, what is the hierarchy between human and non-human? Thank you. And there is one more question uh, from Denise Klimenka. I, uh, I think um, it's very interesting to know about the online resources dedicated to bio art? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we actually have a, a bi bibliography published for our master program. You can take a look. I remember we were making this library. Um, the, there is magazines also, I can recall like cloth magazine. They talk about the uh, science art mostly. So if you visit the website of the institutions that I'm mentioning, the Art and Science Center, Aritmo, Symbiotica, um, Museum of Tomorrow, you might find more resources there. And, and Leonardo, Leonardo is an institution that is also giving a lot. Uh, and of course, uh, institutes like Facultative is making different posts. So you, you just keep in touch and there will be more information. Thank you. Uh, I think it was uh, probably the last question. Uh, so thank you one more time to everyone who has joined us to today, this evening. Uh, thank you to Alia Sahariva who enabled uh, this lecture. Um, it was very challenging. It broadened our horizons. Uh, I hope to see you again uh, in our program. Thank you, Laura, and goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Have a nice day. Stay safe. Thank you.